It's Thursday, June 30th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, the murky history of popsicles and freeze pops, or otter pops, or whatever you call them. Plus, those skin mites that live on your face might be able to reveal your geographic ancestry. And the Canadian radio station that only plays one song by Rage Against the Machine now. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. So yesterday I mentioned French's limited edition ketchup popsicle, an unholy creation that would not have been possible without the earlier invention of the popsicle itself. So that sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole, especially once I learned that the popsicle was originally invented by an 11-year-old boy on accident if the story is to be believed. There's no huge reason not to believe it, except that there's not a ton of sources, and things like this do tend to get exaggerated or amended over time. So the story goes that in 1905, an 11-year-old named Frank Epperson in Noe Valley, San Francisco, was messing around with some water, a wooden stick, and some powdered soda mix. He got distracted somehow and left the cup outside overnight. That night, it was unseasonably cold, record-level cold for San Francisco, and the drink had frozen by the time he found it again in the morning, with the stick standing right up in the middle of it. Epperson took the stick and was able to pull the frozen drink out of the cup, eating it just like that. Epperson dubbed his creation in Epsicle and went on to sell it around his neighborhood while he was growing up. Then in his late 20s, in 1923, he started selling the Epsicles at Neptune Beach, a Coney Island-esque amusement park in Alameda that closed in 1939. NPR claims that the snow cone was also first introduced at Neptune Beach, but I couldn't find any citation for that. Many sources claim the snow cone was first introduced at the State Fair of Texas in 1919 by Samuel Burt, who at least holds a patent for the ice-crushing machine that would come to be used for snow cones. Earlier patents for electric shavers and hand shavers existed in the 19th century, though, used primarily in theaters during the summer months before the advent of air conditioning. But a more DIY version was popular with moms in Baltimore even before that, around the 1850s. Baltimore was on the delivery route for wagons, taking enormous blocks of ice from ice houses in New York to stores and homes in Florida. And when the wagon would pass through town, kids would chase after it asking for scrapings of ice. Their moms soon began adding vanilla, sugar, and other flavors to the ice scrapings to make them even more of a special treat. And perhaps this uncertain history of the snow cone can tell us something about the history of the popsicle as well. Did Epperson really create it as a boy in 1905? In the long history of frozen treats, had no one else really ever thought to put them on a stick before? Here's just a few other examples of frozen delicacies prior to the 20th century, from Food and Wine, quote, a millennium ago, Cleopatra supposedly served Mark Antony a semi-frozen slushy, and Nero dispatched slaves to get snow from nearby mountains simply to make a sorbet-like dessert. Along with silk, Marco Polo brought back recipes for frozen desserts from the Far East. George Washington purchased a cream machine for ice he kept at his Mount Vernon home, and Dolly Madison often served ice cream at presidential dinners. End quote. And San Francisco Gate says that frozen fruit on a stick might go back as far as 1872, when, quote, two men called Ross and Robbins were selling a similar treat they called the Hokey Pokey, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. A prominent ice cream company was also experimenting with frozen suckers around the same time as Epperson's accidental discovery, end quote. So suckers, or lollipops, and fruit aren't quite the same as the more fruit juice kind of treat that Epperson was making, but is the story about him creating it as a boy true, or just something he made up to give the whole creation a bit more of a folksy feel and pass himself off as a lifelong entrepreneur? Did he perhaps really just invent the popsicle in 1924 when he debuted it at Neptune Beach and patented the design? 
Some people think it's likely, considering at least one part of the origin story that doesn't add up. The big eureka moment happened because the drink he left down on the porch overnight froze, but freezing temperatures in the San Francisco area aren't too common, even back then. According to Collectors Weekly, it never dipped below freezing in San Francisco in 1905, and SF Gate adds that even if it were to get unusually cold in one part of the city, Noe Valley, where Epperson lived during his alleged popsicle inventing years, is one of the warmer corners of the city. But I mean, hey, maybe Epperson misremembered exactly when he discovered the popsicle. After all, his family moved to Oakland a few years later, and it did dip below freezing there in 1908, when Epperson would have been about 14. Or, you know, maybe it was close to freezing in the part of town measured for weather records, but cold enough on Epperson's porch or within the cup he'd left that water and soda mixture in for it to at least get a little slushy. Adding to the theory that he just invented this story, though, is that the only other year temperatures dropped below freezing in Oakland was in 1924, the same year he filed the patent for the popsicle. Regardless of the authenticity of the origin story, Epperson was indeed the main person hawking the newfangled stick-in-frozen-juice thing at least for a short time. Other people pretty quickly caught on, and Epperson, while he had patented the technology as a frozen confectionery on a stick, he had not trademarked the name. In the early years, he was still calling it an Epsicle, but his kids told him that wasn't marketable. They always called them Pops Sickles, so why not Popsicle? Or at least, that's how the story goes. Again, it could be apocryphal. See, this is all around the same time that competitors were cropping up, and it seems like they were calling their treats popsicles, potentially based on the satisfying pop sound that the treats made when they were pulled out of the test tubes they were originally made in. And within a few years, Epperson had set up a royalty agreement with the Joe Lowe Corporation, who thought that they could really help Popsicle blow up, since they were, at the time, the largest purveyor of ingredient supplies to the ice cream industry. They would eventually go on to change their name to the Popsicle Corporation and start suing competitors for patent and trademark infringements. They were doing gangbusters, but Epperson saw almost none of it. When the stock market crashed in 1929, Epperson was forced to sell all of the patent rights to the corporation as well, and reported to the San Francisco Chronicle later in his life that he never made the money he could have for his creation. These days, Popsicle is owned by Good Humor Briars, which is owned by Unilever, meaning basically every company that's still around that Popsicle once tried to sue is now all owned by the same company, and selling about 2 billion Popsicles every year. But of course, another innovation in fruity frozen treats came along in the late 60s. Instead of eating them on a stick, how about slurping them up through a long plastic pouch? Flavor ice, otter pops, freezies, freeze pops, freeze sticks, they go by so many names that sometimes people don't even know what to call them, or aren't sure what someone else means when they name check the one they grew up with. They're the 10 inch long clear plastic sticks with flavored colored water inside of them that you buy in big bunches at the grocery store and take home to freeze. Popeyes technically invented them in the 1960s, and they were quickly bought out by the Gel Cert Company. Originally named for a gelatin dessert, hence the name Gel Cert, the company made it big in 1929 with a powdered drink mix called Flavor Aid, aka the big Kool Aid competitor, and the one that was actually drunk by the victims of the Jonestown massacre, not Kool Aid. But, anyways, Gel Cert, makers of Flavor Aid, bought up Popeyes in 1969 and introduced Flavor Flavor Ice. Otter Pops hit the scene as a competitor the following year, but Gelsert later bought them too, in 1996. So basically, just like so many popsicles and other frozen ice cream treats, no matter what you call these frozen ice sticks, they're basically all owned by the same company in the end. Now, if you want a real good frozen treat for the summer, my favorite is New Orleans-style snowballs, made straight from a local stand. Originating in but not exclusive to New Orleans, snowballs are made from fluffier and more powdery ice shavings than snow cones. The New Orleans versions are often a bit juicier from the flavored syrups, of which there are typically dozens of wild and creative options, and they include ample mix-ins from gummies and cookie crumbs to condensed milk or soft serve. They are seriously delicious, really hit the spot on a hot summer day, and have yet to be bogged down by any corporate trademark and patent dealing. 
I might just have to go get one from the stand in my neighborhood now. So last week, I did a thoroughly skin-crawling segment about skin mites and new findings about the creatures thanks to a team that recently sequenced their entire genome. But there's one aspect of mites that was discovered in a previous study which I didn't cover. Apparently, mites can indicate where we came from. A genetic analysis from 2016 found that the Demodex folliculorum, the same species whose genome was recently sequenced, have markers in their mitochondrial DNA that differ based on where the people whose skin they inhabit are from. In other words, different human populations have different mites, which follow the families through generations and are not easily transferable between humans. Quoting Science Daily, To understand how and why mites vary geographically, study authors sampled 70 human hosts from around the world. For some subjects, intact mites were collected by drawing the curved end of a bobby pin across the participant's forehead. In others, metal laboratory spatulas were used to take samples that included a mix of hair and skin cells, including mites, from cheek and outer nose. The scientists then sequenced mite DNA to look at the mitochondrial DNA of each subject's mites. We discovered that people from different parts of the world host different mite lineages, says senior author Michelle Trotvine. The continent where a person's ancestry originated tended to predict the types of mites on their faces. We found that mite lineages can persist in hosts for generations. Even if you move to a faraway region, your mites stick with you. End quote. And it kind of makes sense that the mites would want to stick around. They're parasites, and as the more recent study revealed, they may be evolving to be even more parasitic, more dependent on their human hosts, and unable to do much of anything, even mate, thanks to how cozy they've gotten in our skin. But they could still tell us something about human evolution and the dispersal of humans around the globe thanks to these unique genetic markers. Listeners of 1049 KISS FM in Vancouver got a gnarly surprise on Wednesday. Instead of their usual pop hits, the station was playing Rage Against the Machine's number one hit, Killing in the Name, over and over and over again. It kept going on a loop at least until the early afternoon. Even when listeners called in requesting a change, or just to figure out if the station was aware of what was happening, they were denied. The Guardian tried calling the station, but the person who answered in the booth gave no direct answers and insisted on being called a fake name, Apollo. Now, Killing in the Name is a powerful song that could easily yield a lot of theories for the motive here. Written in the wake of the murder of Rodney King in 1992 and the subsequent L.A. riots, the song is a critique of police brutality and the military-industrial complex. Among other things, it hints at a tie between the LAPD and the Ku Klux Klan. It also includes 16 instances of the F-word, but 1049 played the clean radio edit. Regular listeners to the station and local media quickly surmised that the all-day Rage Against the Machine loop could be an intermediary before the station announces some major changes that have recently been hinted at. Two of their popular morning hosts, Kevin Lim and Sonia Sidhu, announced on Tuesday that they would be leaving the station. The hosts said in their final broadcast, quote, KISS is changing, and unfortunately, we were informed we won't be a part of this new chapter. End quote. So, was the all-day killing in the name the work of hosts Lim and Sidhu, or a fellow staffer upset about the change? Was a rogue radio employee doing this in protest? Apollo, the anonymous employee who picked up the phone and seemed to be running the booth, said the song was already playing on loop when he arrived at the station. But he also didn't stop it, saying, quote, I'm not allowed to say. I'm just a guy in a booth, letting the rage play over and over. What do you think? Do you like it? End quote. But maybe it was the station's doing. The Vancouver Sun pointed out that back in 1992, a Milwaukee radio station played REM's It's the End of the World for an entire weekend before making a big switch to a different genre focus as a station. Some listeners suspect that's the sort of change coming for 1049 KISS FM. In an email to the Vancouver Sun, a spokesperson for the company that owns the station didn't provide much clarity, but did say to watch on the 30th for more on their plans for 1049. So by the time you're listening to this, perhaps all will have been revealed.
Excellent news for horror comedy fans. Diablo Cody of Juno, United States of Terra, and Jagged Little Pill fame is set to write and produce a movie called Lisa Frankenstein. Quoting Deadline, Set in 1989, the film follows an unpopular high schooler who accidentally reanimates a handsome Victorian corpse during a lightning storm and starts to rebuild him into the man of her dreams using the broken tanning bed in her garage. End quote. Uh, yes, please. Love the teen girl spin on the genre-defying book written by a literal teenage girl, and what seems to be a more updated, gender-swapped take on weird science. Also very here for that. Lisa Frankenstein is set to star Catherine Newton and Cole Sprouse, both already established in the offbeat supernatural realm, Newton with the Blumhouse body swap comedy Freaky, and Sprouse in Riverdale. Now listen, 1980s teen-led horror comedy is possibly my favorite genre, and I'm both an enormous Frankenstein fan and a huge admirer of Diablo Cody, so I'm pretty sure the algorithm just created this movie just for me. But I am mentioning it on the off chance anyone else in the world is also interested. But in other news, specifically Cool Stuff Ride Home news, Monday is July 4th, which in the United States means a full weekend of eating barbecue and blowing things up in celebration of something none of us can agree on. So in honor of that, I am going to be taking a long weekend. So no show tomorrow, Friday, or Monday. But I will be back in your podcast feeds on Tuesday the 5th. And whether or not you're celebrating, I hope you all have a fun and safe weekend. I'll talk to you again on Tuesday.